Hello, and welcome to Sailing and Cruising the East Coast of the United States podcast. I'm Bela Musitz. And I'm Mike Wasserman. Hey, this is our podcast about sailing the East Coast of the United States. In some episodes, we'll focus on passages and destinations. In other episodes, we'll talk about boats, equipment, and techniques. And when we come across an interesting person, we'll try to get them as a guest on the show. Now, what makes this podcast a little bit unusual is that only one of us sails. And that would be me, Bela. I've been sailing for over 30 years, not across oceans, but on lakes and coastal cruising on the East Coast of the United States. Now, I, Mike, know very little about sailing. As a matter of fact, I don't know why some boys are red and some are green. I confuse port with starboard, and I never understood why there are no ropes on a board and a sheet is actually a rope. So I'll ask most of the questions, and Vela, you try to answer. You know, Mike, before we dive into this episode, uh, I just wanted to thank all of our listeners and our supporters. Uh, We really do appreciate all of you. Uh, It makes uh, what we do uh, worthwhile, and we're really enjoying seeing our numbers go up and a number of our listeners go up. And the other thing I want to say is that uh, all of our podcasts are now available on YouTube, as well as your favorite podcasting app. So for those of you who like to consume things on YouTube, uh, you can find them there. Just search for Sailing the East. And uh, the more recent ones, actually, uh, you can see Mike and I. Uh, on the uh, on the video part, whereas the earlier ones uh, just have audio. So just another outlet for all of you. Uh, so thanks again to all of our listeners, and a special thanks to you, our supporters. Great. Bela, now over here in Germany, it's starting to get cold, and the days are getting shorter. I assume it's the same in the northeastern U.S. for you. Is this the end of your sailing season? Yeah, unfortunately it is. Uh, you know, we've already had some below freezing temperatures here at home. Uh, some nice heavy frost. And, uh, you know, we're recording this on November 3rd, and uh, I'm actually starting to think about skiing. I I took my skis out the other day and dusted them off and start thinking about where all my equipment is. So it's just around the corner. So the change in seasons is here. Yeah, it is. What's your overall assessment of kind of sailing 2022? How was the sailing season for you this year, looking back? Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty good. Uh, this is number sailing season number three on paradox, uh, our Hunter 45 Dexalon, uh, you know, and in many ways, uh, the sailboat is our summer home at the ocean. Uh, that's, that's really what it's more like than for a hardcore sail sailing. Uh, we've had lots of family visits, uh, which is really, really good. Um, I have one son that lives here near me in Saratoga Springs and he and his family came out three times. Um, and, uh, it's a, like, like for us, it's a long trip. So they typically come out for long weekends, uh, three day weekends or something like that. So my son, his wife, and their two daughters, and he's got two daughters ages, uh, eight and six. And, uh, one of the highlights of the summer was at the end of one of those long weekends, uh, the two girls, our two granddaughters, uh, stayed behind with Elaine and I on the boat for a week. Uh, So that was a really a lot of fun, Uh, you know, and the girls really got into it. Uh, They like to play this role of uh, assistant captain and first mate. Uh, So they they self-labeled themselves, self-identified themselves as one of them being the assistant captain and the other one first mate. And uh, I actually got them T-shirts made, uh, you know, that have like a sailboat on it. And it says their name and first mate and their name and assistant captain. So that was really exciting for them. And uh, they like to they like to play this game of who's on duty and who's off duty. So one of them will be on duty. The other one will be off duty. And and sometimes the duty only lasts like 30 seconds. <laughs> you know? uh, so it's, it's really interesting. And, you know, being the nerdy engineer that I am, I have checklists for a lot of things like pre-departure checklist, uh, coming into back to the marina checklist, leaving the boat checklist you know, putting the sales up checklist. Uh, and it's, you know, so I don't, don't forget things. That's the main reason for it. And, and one of them really likes going over those checklists. Like when we get ready to do something, she'll run down and get the checklist and say, okay, pop, let's go. We got to go over the ch- checklist. Um, and you know, the kids, kids love exploring new places. And, uh, so a couple of times we went, um, uh, and stayed at other marinas. And, uh, so that worked out really well. Because uh, 
the marina we're at is part of this uh, safe harbor uh, group of marinas. So there's been a private equity firm that's been buying up marinas, and you know they've been sort of uh, unifying services and things. And so if you're a member of one of these safe harbor marinas, you can actually stay at other marinas, other safe harbor marinas for free, uh, which is pretty good benefit. Uh, you know, a lot of these marinas cost three to five bucks a foot up here in New England. Some are even more expensive than that. And at 45 feet, you can figure that out. It's pretty expensive, you know, just for a place to park your boat for the night. Uh, so we took advantage of that and uh, went to a couple of other marinas uh, with the girls. And uh, that was a big blast for them because they got to explore. And all of these marinas have pools. And for kids that age, you know, there's nothing better than a swimming pool to hang out a couple hours. Uh, so that was really nice. That was with Jason, uh, the son that lives up here and close to us uh, up here in upstate New York. And my other son lives down near the boat, five minute walk from the boat. And uh, so we oftentimes, Elaine and I go down to the boat uh, we actually, uh, sail a little bit and spend a fair amount of time helping them, uh, work on their house that they bought, which was built in the 1920s. So they've been doing a pretty major overhaul of their house. And, uh, so spend a fair amount of time pounding nails and building decks or rebuilding decks and tearing down walls and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but they got out on the boat, uh, also for a couple of long weekends and, you know, they have, uh, a 14 month old girl. Uh, and, uh, so that's worked out really well. And, uh, I guess the other big thing I did this year was I sort of was, uh, developing my solo sailing skills and, uh, going out on the boat myself. And I, I found that one of the reasons I did that, not, not because I like to go out myself, but it really makes you think through the things that you're doing. And it really makes you sort of plan your next move and think through the whole trip. Uh, because when you're by yourself, you have to do everything yourself. And uh, it, I think it really hones your sailing skills. And it's it's something that I recommend. And, of course, we did three episodes on that. We did episode 65, which was all about docking the boat solo. Then we did episode 67, which was, was about anchoring and motoring, mooring, excuse me, anchoring and mooring uh, solo. And then episode 68 was about managing your sales when you're by yourself. So I think those were the, the big highlights of the summer, Mike. That was quite a year, Bill. It sounds like you had really an incredibly high psychological return on the substantial financial and time investments that you've made in Paradox. It's, it's great to see. Yeah. Um, let's look at the other side. Did you have any difficulties or problems with the boat this season? Mm, yeah. Actually, it's been pretty good. Uh, I had, uh, the fuel gauge, uh, which says amount of fuel I have left in on the boat has been sort of intermittent, uh, since I got the boat and the beginning of this season, it just stopped working altogether. So it always says empty and I keep track of the number of hours I run the engine. The engine actually has a little hour meter on it. So it, it keeps track for you. And so I keep track of the number of hours, the number, amount of fuel I put in. And uh, all of these engines sort of uh, have little charts that'll tell you how much fuel they burn per hour. And, and my engine burns slightly less than three quarters of a gallon of diesel fuel per hour. So I, I've been keeping track of it that way to make sure I don't run out of fuel because you don't want to do that. But then I decided to tackle the, okay, what's going on with the fuel gauge? And um, lots of times it's a, it's a descending unit, which is in the tank. Uh, the fuel tank is underneath the master bedroom, uh, bed bunk. And, uh, so I, I got in there one day and I did some electrical tests on the fuel gauge without having to take it out. And it looked like the fuel gauge sending unit, uh, was working properly. And, um, so then I start chasing down, okay, if that's working, okay, what else can it be? Uh, and, uh, it turns out it was a power problem that the the unit the sending unit was not getting power and then i chased that down to a circuit breaker that was corroded so you know the salt environment's pretty pretty nasty and uh the circuit breaker got corroded so it it uh wasn't working properly so i replaced the circuit breaker and now 
the fuel gauge works great. Uh, what else? The other thing that happened was I have three water tanks on the boat and uh, three separate water tanks. They each hold about 50 gallons of water and the forward water tank gauge <laughs> is not working. So uh, that one's a little more buried and it's a little more work to get to it. So uh, I've been, uh, I haven't tackled that one yet, but uh, hopefully that's just another simple problem to, to sort of solve. And uh, what else happened? Oh, the other thing was uh, early in the season, I installed that uh, AIS unit, the automatic identification system that basically lets me see other boats and other boats see me. Uh, and that, we covered that in episode 62. Um, so that was uh, uh, pretty good. Uh, so uh, other than that, no real big problems. Nothing really broke. It was pretty good. Nice. Yeah, sounds all pretty minor stuff. You know, you put a lot of hours in underway this season. Mm. Did you have any notable sailing mishaps? Uh, none notable and none even unnotable. <laughs> I think I think the only thing that happened was one time Andy and his wife took the boat out um, by themselves. And uh, the following day, he told me he had trouble rolling up the mainsail. Now, if you remember, we talked about this. The mainsail rolls up into the mast. Uh, much like a window shade rolls up around the uh, the thing that it rolls up around for a window. And the challenge when it rolls into the mast is you have to roll it snugly because it's rolling into a confined space. And I've developed a technique that puts the proper amount of back pressure on it while you're rolling it up so it rolls up nice and tight. And uh, he he didn't have enough back pressure on it, and it kind of got rolled up loosely and then yeah, it's three quarter rolled up. He couldn't roll it up anymore. And then what you basically have to do is just kind of get it unstuck and unroll it and then roll it back up nice and snug. But other than that, it was a real good, uh, real good season. Nice. So yeah, for all those hours, very, very few problems. Yeah. Again, a nice return on your investment, uh, a little bit of preventive maintenance, a little bit of engineering approach and a little bit of luck probably. Right. So yeah. Yeah. Um, what a, what about what about winterizing? You know, we covered this mm -hmm. in episode six and you covered the topic really nicely and went kind of step by step. I learned a lot from that one. Anything new this year and how you're winterizing the boat? Uh, not really, other than I'm getting a little more efficient at it. You know, I'm figuring out little shortcuts um, so that it's going faster. So that's good. Uh, the You know, I got to winterize the, just to summarize, I got to winterize the generator, the air conditioning system, uh, the engine and the water system and on the generator, the air conditioner and the engine, all three of those use seawater to cool them. So that means they have water running through them and I have to take that seawater out and replace it with antifreeze so that they don't freeze up over the, over the winter. And then for the water system, the, the, the water at the sink and the toilets, uh, I need to, you know, get all that fresh water out of there and put in this RV uh, non-toxic antifreeze uh, so that those pipes don't freeze over the winter. And the water system is the most challenging. It takes me about 20 gallons of antifreeze to winterize uh, the whole boat, uh, probably 14 of those going to the water system itself. And, and one of the big uses of all of that antifreeze is the hot water tank. So I have a, a, a 10 gallon hot water tank on the boat and I got to drain all the fresh water out of that. And the only way I can, at least the way it's configured now, winterize the hot water system is I got to replace all that water in the, in the tank with antifreeze before the, that antifreeze will start going through the hot water pipes. So there is a, a bypass I can put in there, which I've been trying to figure out how to do efficiently which would just take the hot water tank. I can drain the hot water tank and not have to fill it with the antifreeze. And, you know, speaking of the antifreeze, this non-toxic antifreeze last year was $4.99 a gallon, and this year it was $9.99 a gallon. So the price almost doubled. Uh, so that also gives me some motivation to maybe figure out how to put that bypass in around the water heater. That makes sense. pays for itself. But, you know, that doesn't surprise me. We've seen a lot of inflation over here in Germany as mm -hmm. well. Do yeah. you have anything left to do on Paradox for the <clears> winter, or can you start solely focusing on skiing? Uh, nope. I got one more trip to go, uh, heading out there this weekend. Uh, so I just actually talked to the marina uh, uh, this morning, 
and uh, the boat's being hauled out today. Uh, we put up on the hard, and so I'm heading out over the weekend. I got to uh, cover the boat. I have a big ca- three-piece canvas cover that I put on the boat for the winter. I got to disconnect the batteries. Uh, my son, Andy, will will come and help me put the cover on because it's pretty heavy, uh, and it's a pers- two-person job. And, uh, you know, I don't do the shrink wrap. A lot of people use this plastic shrink wrap that gets put on boats. You see it. It's typically white. And it just seems like that's such a waste of plastic to me because it's not reusable, right? I mean, yeah, they recycle it. But so the boat came with a nice canvas cover uh, that I get multiple. uh, Hopefully, it'll get 10, 15 years use out of that. Um, And then I got to remove the steering wheels. So both steering wheels on the boat have a leather wrapping or a leather cover. And the stitching on some of that is uh, starting to come undone. So I'm going to bring those steering wheels home and, you know, nice winter project to fix the stitching uh, that holds that leather wrap around the steering wheels. So, but that should be it for the spring. Yeah. Nice, Bela. Glad you could share your end of season insights with us. It seems like you kind of learned a lot and and had a great time. Do you have any replacements or upgrades planned for the spring that's going to occupy your attention during this winter? Or is it kind of out of sight, out of mind? Uh, No, I don't have anything planned. Uh, I think the boat's in good shape. It's got all the systems on it that I want. I I don't really want to upgrade any of the electronics or any of that stuff. Everything seems to work fine. Uh, So I, I uh, I think I'm pretty happy with stuff. Yeah. Nice. Lessons learned to want to share with the audience? Mm. You know, the, the, the one the one big thing I say is, you know, I basically waited, waited until retirement to buy this big boat. Uh, and it it's just has turned out to be so good. And, and not because I'm a sailing fanatic, but just the whole family experience, the, the extended family experience. We've had nieces there, nephews there aunts and uncles, et cetera. Don't wait. <laughs> Don't, if, if you, if you have the inkling to do something like this or do something in life, don't wait, do it because, you know, as some, as somebody once famous said, nobody on their deathbed ever said, gee, I wish I spent more time at work. <laughs> and you know, Love. so if you want to do some stuff, figure out how to do it and take the time and do it. That's, that's my That's my lesson from buying the boat, I guess. I love it, Bela. Great. And we have some interesting off-season topics lined up to talk about in the podcast Mm -hmm. during the winter to get us and everybody through to springtime. Uh, What do you think? Time to wrap it up? Yep, let's wrap this one up, Mike. Well, listeners, thanks for joining us once again for another episode. We hope you found our conversation today interesting and maybe a little thought-provoking. If you have questions about what we've discussed, uh, please feel free to get in touch with us. Our email is sailingtheeast, all one word, at gmail.com. Hey, and if you enjoyed the podcast, please hit that follow button on your favorite podcasting application and tell your friends about the show as well. So until next time, signing off from Chile, upstate New York. See you soon. Sounds great, Bela, from over here in Münster, Germany. See you next time.